Welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Muhammad El Aryan, who is president of Queens College at Cambridge University and also uh, chief economic advisor at Allianz and also a professor at Wharton, I understand. Yes, and thanks for having me, Andy. Great to see you, Mohammed. Um, I want to start off by asking you a little bit about the Federal Reserve interest rate policy. I know you've been critical of Jay Powell, um, but I guess my question, Mohammed, is, is it too early to be critical? I mean, don't we have to wait until everything sorted itself out and maybe he will stick a perfect landing, lo and behold, in the next 12 months and it'll all be fine? I sure hope so. Um, let me just start by saying it's very unusual for me to be critical of any central bank, let alone the Fed. I grew up in that world. I admire them greatly, and I think they play a central role. But I also think that when a central bank makes repeated mistakes, it needs to be held accountable. And it needs to be held accountable because accountability is key for its political independence. Politically independent central banks are absolutely crucial to the good running of an economy. And without accountability, you don't get politically independent central banks. So that is why I have been unusually critical, because this Fed has made mistakes. So is it too early? No. We know, for example, that the transitory inflation call was false. Transitory means not only short term, but it means people don't change behaviors. They believe it's temporary and it's reversible. Well, people did change behaviors. So it's not too early to call that a mistake. It's not too early to call communications a mistake. There's evidence now that during the press conferences of this Fed, markets are three times as volatile as they've been in the past because the message hasn't been consistent. And finally, it's not too early to call a third mistake, which is not owning your own mistakes. The Fed is the only major central bank that hasn't come up in public and explained why it got inflation so wrong and why did it start so late in countering inflation. The European Central Bank has done that. The Bank of England has done that. So I don't think it's too early. It doesn't mean we should not hope that they can land perfectly. I sure hope so because there's a lot at stake, but I fear that it's unlikely that they will do so. You just said, Mohammed, that it's important for the Federal Reserve to be independent. Are you suggesting, therefore, it's not independent? No, it is independent, but that independence- But that's not acting independently? If there's a sense that the central bank is messing up continuously, political system gets involved because we give them enormous power. They're the only public agency that does not have to go to Congress to make a major decision that influences all our lives. If the administration wants to raise taxes, if it wants to raise spending, they have to go. If the Federal Reserve wants to inject $7 trillion worth into the economy, it can do that. If it wants to cut and raise interest rate, it doesn't need to go to Congress. Now, it's critical that they have that independence, what's called operational autonomy, but they need to deliver on it. Don't you think some of that um, activity by the Fed, though, was in response to the perception that in 2008, Washington, which is both fiscal and monetary policy, underreacted to the financial crisis? So this time, they didn't want to err on that side? Yes, I, I in fact, was among the people who was urging them to do more in March of 2020 when we got the sudden stop on COVID. However, it's what happened thereafter. I'll give you a very simple example. In March of 2022, when the inflation print had gone above 7%, the Fed was still injecting emergency liquidity into the system. They should have stopped. They should have stopped a year earlier, but they didn't. I think it's very easy to flood the system with money because people love that. It's much harder to make the political decision of, to use the phrase, retiring the punch bowl when the, part, when the party is getting going. But that's what a central bank needs to do. And how is it possible, or, or why do you think Jay Powell was still um, expansive with a 7% print then? So there's lots of explanations. I don't know what the right one is. One is just faulty analysis and forecasts. 
So it could be simply that the analytics were wrong. Secondly, is that he didn't want to prematurely stop a strong recovery. And he made a judgment that turned to be false. Third, some people have claimed, I have not, that this was part of his, his renomination process. We've had two senior federal officials that are no longer federal officials that have said in public that had he been renominated earlier, they would have tightened policy earlier. So we will never know the reasons, but what we do know is that they have been late. And because of that, they had delivered the most concentrated rate hiking cycle we've had for decades. And because of that, not only have we put growth um, in play, but financial stability as well. And that last point that those two people made is quite the indictment. Um, Warren Buffett recently said in Japan that he's fine with what Jay Powell has done, and he thinks the greater sin was on the fiscal side. What do you think about that? So I respect Warren tremendously. Um, but on this one, I don't agree with him. I think the fiscal side was justified by real uncertainties about how the economy worked. Now, did it go too far? Yes. You know, I remember my daughter who kept her job. She was lucky enough to be able to work from home and she was delighted to get two checks in the mail. In a perfect world, that sort of support would have been more targeted and should have been more targeted. But there was a real question mark as to how do you support people at a time when everything has changed? And I think on that one, no problems with emergency responses, but I do have problems with, with what happened when the impact of the pandemic was well behind us. Shifting gears, I wanna ask you about the latest problem in the banking sector, which comes from all the, the, the problems we've been talking about or the situation with the Federal Reserve and, the interest, and interest rates, of course. What lessons are we to draw from this uh, banking, I, I hate to use the word crisis because I don't know, if it, I don't think it was a crisis. We don't know if it's over yet either. But what have you drawn from this, Mohammed? So thank you for, for not calling it a crisis. The other day I was on TV and the anchor said, banking crisis, I said, this is not a crisis. This is turbulence. We don't have a problem with the banking system. We have a, a problem with a few banks. And that's a fundamental difference. And that's why this is not 2008. Look, when you bring three things together, you're sure to have problems. One is badly managed banks. Two is a mishandled interest rate cycle. And three is lapses in bank supervision. The Silicon Valley Bank now is well documented. They had all three problems coming together at the same time. And what we've learned is that we have to pay greater attention as to how the financial system embraces low interest rates, abundant liquidity, believes that the Federal Reserve is their best friend forever, because when that paradigm changes, it catches people offside, and there can be massive consequences. You know, we have now guaranteed all deposits. I don't think we would have done that had we not been forced over a weekend in a very extreme situation but it's not really good for us to do that. But there's no way back, unfortunately. We aren't technically guaranteeing all deposits, but wink, wink, we are kind of, right? So Andy, once you do it for one bank, and the way you do it is you don't go to Congress and ask to change the law, you trigger this exception, this very powerful exception that exists that allows you to do something like that. Once you do it for a bank that serves tech, that serves mainly rich people, you'll have to do it for other banks. Otherwise, you've got a massive political problem on your hands. You've worked and work in both the private sector and in universities. Um, what is the, the difference, compare and contrast? I mean, you worked at PIMCO, you worked at Allianz, you worked at Harvard, Harvard Management, running their endowment. You're now the president of Queens at Cambridge University. What are the differences and similarities there? So the biggest similarity is content. Content really matters. Um, and I've been very lucky, whether it's been at PIMCO, whether it's Cambridge University, to be surrounded um, by really smart people. And I learn all the time. Um, what differs is the operational aspects. Um, it's, it, it is, you know, it's completely different worlds. Um, one moves much faster. W one is much more deliberative than the other. Um, 
But I think that the, the combining them is actually a very powerful process. Um, and at the end of the day, I remember um, friends always telling me, you need three things. You need content to make sure that you've analyzed the situation correctly. You need the courage to act quickly, not wait for 100%, but 90% is good enough. And then you need the ability to communicate and learn from your mistake and course correct. Um, these three things are as present in the private sector as they are outside the private sector. I want to go back, actually, Mohammed, and ask you a couple more questions about banking. Um, what is the optimal level of regulation, and can we ever tame the animal spirits? That is a great question, and we don't know, Andy. So before the crisis, problems were with the big banks, and we thought the problem was with the universal banking system, which is what's called narrow banking. You take deposits and you make loans. And then you have the universal banks, which include investment banking and everything else. And the conventional wisdom is that they are problematic and the others are fine. Of course, the failures we got were not in the, what we thought was problematic. They came in what's called the narrow bank, banks that don't have capital markets activity. Um, they don't have investment banking. So we are still trying to figure out. I think what we're going to see is increasingly a tendency to try to treat banks as utilities, to think that when they make mistakes, it's simply too costly for society. So I, I suspect, unfortunately, coming out of this um, episode, we're going to have more regulation, which will mean that the banks will play less of a role in lubricating economic activity. And that's unfortunate, but that's the cost of irresponsibility. Meaning the money will go to the shadow banking sector instead? So that's going to continue, and we need to understand the shadow banking system better. They are under-regulated. They are under-supervised. But, you know, when there's a massive crash on a freeway, the first reaction is to bring down the speed limit. Now, that's not the optimal reaction, but that's what we do, okay? And I think that's what you're going to see. Um, they're going to make the banking system subject to a lower speed limit, which means more regulation, more supervision. Some people have suggested, Mohammed, that this latest trouble in the banking sector um, has some uh, causes coming from the fact that people can transfer their money on their phones. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the numbers, Andy, are stunning. On the Thursday of its problems, Silicon Valley Bank lost $42 billion. On the Friday it was projected to lose 100 billion of deposits, um, which of course it could not meet and that's why it had to be shut down. Now in the old days, you and I would go stand in line and there was sand in the wheel. It would take us a long time to get to the counter, to get the money out. Um, now it happens at the speed of light. Again, efficiency and resilience. Um, we've learned whether it's supply chain, supply chains or whether it is deposit runs, that in pursuing efficiency in a very focused manner and making the system more efficient, more efficient, more efficient, we lose resilience. And somehow we're going to have to strike that balance. I think companies have realized it, that with the supply chain. So you hear it's not just about just in time, it's also just in case. And they're now building resilience as well as efficiency. I, I love that metaphor with supply chain. I hadn't thought about that. Mohammed, final question, and I promised you I was going to ask you about this. You're New York Jets. Hope springs eternal. I think I've asked you this for a number of years in a row, and you haven't won the Super Bowl yet. Um, so I'm assuming that next year is going to be the year. So first of all, the problem is that we did win the Super Bowl in 1969. And the reason that was a problem is that's when I fell in love with the Jets, with Joe Namath. And I've been waiting since then. Um, I fear that you're going to be asking me that question over and over again. We're not going to be winning the Super Bowl for a while. Um, every year, I'm going to go through the same process, and all the Jets fans go through it. We go through it in, in, in individual games as well, where we have great hope, only to be disappointed. But I think that is the burden we carry as Jets fans, and we're very loyal, by the way. Are there any in uh, Cambridge? Jets fans? Yeah. No, they're smarter than that. They're much smarter than that. <laughs> Mohamed El Arian, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Andy. You've been watching At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.